Mark Twain Selected Works Autobiographical Dictation Reminiscences of His Wedding February 1st, 1906 Tomorrow will be the 36th anniversary of our marriage. My wife passed from this life one year and eight months ago in Florence, Italy, after an unbroken illness of 22 months' duration. I saw her first in the form of an ivory miniature in her brother Charlie's stateroom in the steamer Quaker City in the Bay of Smyrna in the summer of 1867 when she was in her twenty-second year. I saw her in the flesh for the first time in New York in the following December. She was slender and beautiful and girlish, and she was both girl and woman. She remained both girl and woman to the last day of her life. Under a grave and gentle exterior burned inextinguishable fires of sympathy, energy, devotion, enthusiasm, and absolutely limitless affection. She was always frail in body, and she lived upon her spirit, whose hopefulness and courage were indestructible. Perfect truth, perfect honesty, perfect candor, were qualities of her character which were born with her. Her judgments of people and things were sure and accurate. Her intuitions almost never deceived her. In her judgments of the characters and acts of both friends and strangers, there was always room for charity, and this charity never failed. I have compared and contrasted her with hundreds of persons, and my conviction remains that hers was the most perfect character I have ever met. And I may add that she was the most winningly dignified person I have ever known. Her character and disposition were of the sort that not only invite worship, but command it. No servant ever left her service who deserved to remain in it. And as she could choose with the glance of her eye, the servants she selected did in almost all cases deserve to remain, and they did remain. She was always cheerful, and she was always able to communicate her cheerfulness to others. During the nine years that we spent in poverty and debt, she was always able to reason me out of my despairs and find a bright side to the clouds and make me see it. In all that time, I never knew her to utter a word of regret concerning our altered circumstances, nor did I ever know her children to do the like. For she had taught them, and they drew their fortitude from her. The love which she bestowed upon those whom she loved took the form of worship, and in that form it was returned, returned by relatives, friends, and the servants of her household. It was a strange combination which wrought into one individual, so to speak, by marriage, her disposition and character and mine. She poured out her prodigal affection and kisses and caresses and in a vocabulary of endearments whose profusion was always an astonishment to me. I was born reserved as to endearments of speech and caresses and Hers broke upon me as the summer waves break upon Gibraltar. I was reared in that atmosphere of reserve. As I have already said in an earlier chapter, I never knew a member of my father's family to kiss another member of it except once, and that at a deathbed. 
and our village was not a kissing community. The kissing and caressing ended with courtship, along with the deadly piano playing of that day. She had the heart-free laugh of a girl. It came seldom, but when it broke upon the ear, it was as inspiring as music. I heard it for the last time when she had been occupying her sick bed for more than a year, and I made a written note of it at the time, a note to be repeated. Tomorrow will be the 36th anniversary. We were married in her father's house in Elmira, New York and went next day by special train to Buffalo, along with the whole Langdon family and with the Beechers and the Twitchells, who had solemnized the marriage. We were to live in Buffalo, where I was to be one of the editors of the Buffalo Express, and a part owner of the paper. I knew nothing about Buffalo, but I had made my household arrangements there through a friend by letter. I had instructed him to find a boarding house of as respectable a character as my light salary as editor would command. We were received at about nine o'clock at the station in Buffalo and were put into several sleighs and driven all over America, as it seemed to me. For apparently we turned all the corners in the town and followed all the streets there were. I scolded him freely and characterizing that friend of mine and very uncomplimentary words for securing a boarding house that apparently had no definite locality. But there was a conspiracy, and my bride knew of it, but I was in ignorance. Her father, Jervis Langdon, had bought and furnished a new house for us in the fashionable street Delaware Avenue and had laid in a cook and housemaids and a brisk and electric young coachman, an Irishman, Patrick McAleer. And we were being driven all over that city in order that one slayful of those people could have time to go to the house and see that the gas was lighted all over it and a hot supper prepared for the crowd. We arrived at last, and when I entered that very place, my indignation reached high watermark. And without any reserve, I delivered my opinion to that friend of mine, for being so stupid as to put us into a boarding house whose terms would be far out of my reach. Then Mr. Langdon brought forward a very pretty box and opened it and took from it a deed of the house. So the comedy ended very pleasantly, and we sat down to supper. The company departed about midnight and left us alone in our new quarters. Then Alan, the cook, came in to get orders for the morning's marketing, and neither of us knew whether beefsteak was sold by the barrel or by the yard. We exposed our ignorance, and Ellen was full of Irish delight over it. 